Hello, everybody. Welcome to World One to One Podcast. I'm your host, the Chapter Done the Rift Wonder, the Nestle Wonder Ball, Mr. Eddie V. Joining me is the Red Velvet Cake himself, the Nordic Beast, Mr. Larry Gift. What up? I and swear I'm gone for a week. I come back and the place is a mess. Uh, how's a mess? <laughs> The oh. best is Tony's audio levels. Holy shit. Oh, I don't know what happened. Tony was so fucking quiet. I, you know what? I had him I had him up, but it might have been his mic um the way that it was picking up cuz I had him I had him up uh, a little bit loud and when I was looking at my broadcaster, his levels was going up. So, I don't know on that part like what happened. So, <laughs> I I do apologize for that people. Um, but we did have that good Zelda discussion about yeah, Zelda it, it 1. It was good. It was worth listening to. You just, you know, got to turn the volume up some. Oh. Um, but, yeah. I can't believe he got mad at me. Well, not mad at me, but he was just <laughs> like, Ugh, what you mean? Zelda, Zelda 1 is not easy. I'm like, yes, it is. I'm like, I beat that so many times as a kid. Like, yeah, in that discussion. Everybody listen to last week's episode and hear... Uh, our lovely West Coast correspondent, Mr. Professor Panty Drop, Mr. Tony Zilakakis and I discussed about Zelda, and we have a very, very good discussion. Uh, but we're going to get into what we've actually been playing. Uh, we're going to be talking about Zelda, and then uh, Larry has a topic that you guys might want to check out. Um, so we're going to discuss about that. But first, Larry, how are you? Uh, what you been playing? I am exhausted. I have been doing everything, and you'll have to forgive. Uh, there's been a, a distinct lack of any kind of content update through the Facebook page because I have been busy as hell um, trying to finish up a couple of things, and I have the, the big review to write tonight yet. Actually, I was hoping to get that done earlier today, but I've had too much on my fucking plate. Um, so I will be writing the Zelda review tonight. That'll go up uh, on Monday. Um which, yes, it's late, but, you know, unlike other big places, we don't get shit beforehand. We get stuff uh, typically, you know, when it actually hits the store shelves, and then we have to power through it. And uh, I, I found myself at a point last week where I was ready. I, I, I could finish the game, or at least the story, just to be able to cap it off, and I didn't want to like i wanted to just keep playing and wandering around and finding more shit and i i did just that but only for uh one extra day um i, I finally got to, i'm like all right i gotta saddle up and you know power through this and actually finish it so i can write something and put it together but um it, it led to some thoughts on what i what i think the uh the the future of the series should be for maybe the next uh, four to six years, give or take. Uh, but we'll be getting into that in a little bit. Uh, beyond that, now that I've actually finished it and I'm still, you know, aching to go back to it, um, it's, it's kind of let me mentally switch gears enough to, uh, play a few other things that are now out on the Switch. Uh, I, when I picked up my Switch, I immediately downloaded Fast Remix and, uh, Shovel Knight Treasure Trove Edition. Um, so I have now officially triple dipped on Shovel Knight because I bought it for the 3DS when it very first came out and then again on the Wii U and now on my Switch and I sprung for the Treasure Trove Edition just because yes I've played uh, you know Shovel of Hope and the uh, the Plague Knight campaign um, but the, the Spectre of Torment campaign is fantastic um, for any number of reasons and I'll get into that in a minute but I also wanted to have the uh, the the full gambit on my Switch again, and God help me if they ever release a physical edition for the uh, Switch, I will probably fucking quadruple dip on it because I am a whore for Shovel Knight. Um, I don't think I can throw enough money at Yacht Club games. Um, but that being said, uh, the Specter Knight campaign, though, oh my God, it's so good. Um, They've done a phenomenal job of completely, for the, the third time, reinventing how you play through the world of Shovel Knight. Um, the, the overworld map is now gone. Um, you are 
you have kind of a little hub world uh, or a hub town in the uh, in the tower, and uh, you you can go out to any of the the levels in any order that you want. Um, and the levels are the same thematic design. The music's tweaked a little bit. Um, I, I'm finding so far that I don't like the, the tweak to the level music as much, but the tweaks on the boss fight music, I like better than the originals from shovel Knight, which mm -hmm. is awesome, but all the way around, it's fantastic. Um, specter Knight himself has some really neat, uh, gameplay and movement and combat, uh, mechanics. Um, the first of which is, uh, wall running and wall jumping. Um, so the, the, the types of walls they're paying very special attention to because if it's like a, a dirt or a rock wall, it's something that he can run up, uh, for a, a short distance and then jump off of, um, or, you know, climb up over a ledge if he reaches the top of that wall. Um, he doesn't have a, a down thrust like Shovel Knight did, but uh, there's still points where you need to, um, you know, attack down through, like, you know, the sand and the rock blocks. And so he instead has this mechanic where if he jumps off of a, uh, a breakable wall or a floor, uh, the, the jump itself will destroy the block or the wall uh, that he's jumping off of. Uh, which is a whole lot of fun. And so they've, they've put a lot of thought into it. Spectre Knight has a huge, uh, a much bigger focus on aerial, uh, combat and maneuver as well. Um, by means of his, uh, his attack is a method of mobility as well. Now, where when you're in the air, you'll see if he's in range of something, be it a, uh, like a, a lantern or an enemy you'll see a slash mark through it going diagonally, and that'll tell you which way that uh, he will whip through that enemy or that lantern, and he'll use it as a, uh, a mobility technique as well as an attack. It's really cool. It takes a little finagling to get the hang of, but by the, by the middle of the first stage, you'll understand it perfectly. And uh, from there, it's just all skill. It's so much fun. Um the, the scrolls have been replaced, uh, well, not directly replaced, but, um, you're, you're no longer finding the, uh, the, the blue chests with the, the merchant in it in each level now. Um, your, your new powers come by collecting red skulls all throughout the level and trading them off at the tower for a, uh, a new ability or a new item. And, uh, you don't just get the item and that's it you get a, a tiny little level that's like, you know, 60 or 90 seconds long that at the same time explains and demonstrates how to use that item as well. Um, so they've, they've done a great job of making something completely fresh yet again, but feels familiar and comfortable in all the right ways. Um, but it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, beyond that, I've been playing with Fast Remix as well, off and on sporadically. Um, it's everything that I loved about, uh, fast racing Neo and more, um, or it's just more of what I loved about fast racing Neo. Uh, it's all the content from, uh, Neo plus all new tracks and machines. Um, that one came in at 20 bucks and for the amount of content there, it's totally justifiable. And then some, uh, it runs and looks just as beautiful as it did on the Wii U. If not, maybe just a hair better. And, uh, the online is still fairly competent. I, I think it doesn't run quite as smooth as it did on the Wii U, but some of that might be inherent to what, what we're reading are potentially some problems with the uh, Wi-Fi antenna on the Switch, um, which rumor has it has been caused, is the cause of, uh, some of the frame issues with, uh, Breath of the Wild as well. Um, beyond that last weekend, also, uh, really got to dig into snipper clips. Uh, my wife and I road tripped to, uh, Ohio, like far east Ohio, like spit and hit Pennsylvania fucking Ohio. And, uh, we stayed with some, uh, with some of her family out there and we cracked open snipper clips and had an absolutely great time. Uh, by its, if I was playing on my own, I don't think I, I would really find the enjoyment out of it. 
but playing with at least two people or more is absolutely hysterical. And the, the conversation uh, between everybody in the room while you're playing it is nothing short of hilarious. Like, dude, no, 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 no. Like, drop lower. No, no, no. Cut my head. No, no. I, I'll cut your ass. Just hold on. It's it's priceless. The puzzles are clever. The the aesthetic is great. Um, you know, it's it's very simple visually. It's it's nothing super astounding, but it's got a distinct charm all its own. I love the fact that like when you cut the little characters, they like giggle and snicker like it fucking tickles. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, but it, it's just, it's adorable and it's a lot of fun. Um, again, if you've got at least one other person to play with, buy it in a heartbeat. Buy it. Yes. But I hope to God they come out with some more content down the line. I would love more puzzles for that game. It, it seems that that game is meant for co-op. It is. Meant, oh, it is. It, you know, it's meant to be fun and funny and get like not not much so, so much as a party setting, but you know, it's just one of those uh, couch buddy movements while people are looking and while you're trying to figure it out, they try to help you solve it. So, you know, it, it just, like you said, that comedic value of, no, do, do, do this, do, do that. You know, it's like that old yeah. school kind of gameplay in a way. Honestly, I think Snipper Clips does a better job at being what Nintendo wanted 1-2 Switch to be. Um, I, I understand that 1-2 Switch was designed to showcase the system capabilities or the mm-hmm. controller capabilities, um, much like Wii Sports did back when. And it one two switch does that, but it doesn't have the the group or the party charm that Snipper Clips does. Well, I think, I think it, because one two switch is more mini games. You know, there's a variety of mini games where yeah. where Snip where Snipper Clips is more uh, puzzle based in a way. Right. So you know, you gotta instead of you know, one two switch doesn't make you think. You just gotta react fast. Where uh, with snipper clips is more puzzle, and so there are two different uh, dynamics right there. You know, like you're not gonna put snipper snipper clips in a party with someone who has amnesia or um, uh, not amnesia. Um, uh, it's the other a word. Um, it's, you know, it, it's just go. It's you know, autism, th- autism, yeah, or something like that. Like you know, that's gonna make you think. But if you could do something that could make you react fast and be like, oh, well, next time I'll get better and get you. You know, right. that kind of competitiveness and what to switch just just shows a different way of how to play games. Where snipper clips is just like you need you you can play the game with somebody else, but the enjoyment is that you have another person sitting by you, and you guys like almost on the same wavelength of thinking about that puzzle and coming up with goofy ways and seeing of uh, it's right and stuff and getting upset or getting confused or just laughing at how things are working and stuff. It's just like the dialogue between each other shows you that you know this is the communication that we need to have to solve this game. You don't use that same commission communication for one to switch. So there's yeah. just different than not dynamics. Yeah. But I think, and, and, yeah. Oh. And then, um, uh, last but not least, uh, yesterday, no, two days ago, Friday, I picked up uh binding of Isaac on uh switch as well. Uh, which is, uh, afterbirth plus, um, I am not wholly unfamiliar with Binding of Isaac. I have it on my Wii U, and I bought that last two summers ago. I played a ton of it when I bought it, mm-hmm. and then I kind of dropped off of it. Um, I'd, I'd pick it up every once in a while for a run here, you know, a run or two here or there. But um, Binding of Isaac on the Wii U was big enough as it was. That was the uh, Binding of Isaac Rebirth which, um, you know, has a fair bit of content. And I'm finding almost immediately going into uh, Afterbirth Plus on the Switch that uh, there's already so much more content than was even in Rebirth. Um, <clears throat> immediately, if you are, 
if you're not paying attention, you won't notice it. But I'm seeing some new enemies um, spotted here and there. Um, there's a ton of new items as well. It's it's a huge, huge game, and it's it's not for everyone. Binding of Isaac is very much a love hate game. It'll either absolutely be your thing, and you will lose hundreds of hours of your life to it, or it's not your cup of tea, and it's a total waste of money for you. But I don't think there's really any in between with uh, with Isaac. Um, that being said, I was perfectly comfortable paying for it. Uh, the, the $40 retail for a, a physical copy, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that I already enjoy it and I'm going to get even more enjoyment out of it, being able to take it with me on the go without it, you know, potentially having the, uh, the broken problems that the 3ds version had. Um, and as far as I've played so far, I haven't run into any, you know, major issues like that. Um, I, I haven't had any real, you know, glitch problems uh, or bugs like the uh, the 3DS version had, and that makes me extremely happy. Um, it plays very smooth. It's it's a very competent port of you know a game that's been around for several years at this point. But uh, that being said, in addition, there is a beautiful little treat, uh, a little gift, a present, if you will, in the. Uh, in the case, if you buy the actual hard copy, um, and that is a manual, which I never thought I'd see the day when I go, I'm excited to get a manual, something that, you know, at one point was just expected. But that being said, not only is there a manual, but it's a beautiful little manual. It's not real big, but it's a gorgeous homage to old NES game manuals. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll, you'll open the case and you'll immediately reminisce to the original legend of zelda manual it's got this beautiful gold color to it the art style uh of all the drawings in there and even just the layout of this thing screams nes manual and it's so fantastic for that like the only thing missing is a little you know three or four page notes section in the back <laughs> it's that cool um and then the first batch copies also have a couple small sheets of Isaac stickers, which, you know, whatever. Um, and then they also have a, a reversible cover art, which, you know, not a big deal, but it's a nice touch. Um, but all in all, it's actually a nice package uh, for 40 bucks. Um, but I've now that I've actually finished Zelda, um, I'm, I'm sinking into more of the stuff that I bought for my Switch that's just kind of been lingering in the background. And uh, I'm enjoying most all of what I've picked up. Um, no real major complaints on any of it at this point. Um, also, uh, just on a quick side note for those that are not aware, uh, while it is not up and running yet, you can download the Splatoon 2 Global Test Fire so that it's ready to go for when that shit goes live. Uh, is it this? Is it this coming weekend, the uh, 25th? I think so. Okay. I think so. I've got to double-check dates. But they do have the download out now on the eShop channel that you can pick that up. Yeah. Uh, also picked up World of Goo for uh, for the wife, and she's enjoying that quite a bit. She's never played it before. Um, I've played it on a couple of platforms and, prior. And can I tell you, people are screaming for people to buy this game. Like, literally, people are losing them. They'd be like, you, everybody, if you own a Switch, get World of Goo. Like, they, they, people just like if you miss it on PC, if you miss it on Wii, uh, Wii, and you feel like this game is not it, you need to get it on Switch and just devour the game. I heard only been heard like really good things, and because people were just like they want to see more of this game on that system, and they think it's a good uh, don't want to say reboot, but a jump start um, for the series for it to become popular. Uh, well, because it really is that, a good game. Not only that, too, but they didn't just put out World of Goo. They put out all, all three of the Future Corp games. Um, so World of Goo is tied to uh, another two games by the same company. Uh, one is uh, Little Inferno, and another is Human Resource Machine. And they, they all kind of loosely connect together, um, kind of in the way that uh, Dead Like Me uh, connected to uh, the show Pushing Daisies, and there was one other that was loosely tied into it, mm -hmm. but we're all part of the same universe. Um, 
So that that's probably about the best analogy I can make. They're all very different games, but they're all kind of in that same universe. Um, so it's World of Goo, though. I have not gotten to actually play it myself. I've watched the wife play a little bit of it, and uh, she seems to have taken to the the motion control pointer control since there's no you know IR like the uh, the Wii had for pointer controls. Um, they are substituting uh, the motion control much the same way as uh, Breath of the Wild did uh, with its motion control and aiming with the uh, bow and arrow. Okay. Uh, it seems to work fairly well. Um, so there there might be a, an avenue, an option there for at least some Wii games to get ported over to the Switch, um, which I, I don't want the system to be bogged down with nothing but ports. But there's a few that I wouldn't mind seeing get a you know one more shot, you know one more run through the ringer. Um, but no, I like you said for a new system, I've got a ton of stuff to play. You know, I, Zelda lasted me; it will continue to last me. You know, but I've still got a bunch of other stuff that I'm playing and I'm really enjoying. You know, uh, there there's a small trickle of stuff coming out week over week on the uh, eShop channel as well. Um, and then I'm, you know, we've also got Mario Kart to look forward to next month on top yeah. of that. So I, you know, I think there's a good steady stream. And I think the fact that the, the launch day selection was small because I think they've lined up a, a steady enough stream that the year one is actually going to be pretty solid. It, it can, it can consistent. I, can I, can That's I, the difference is consistency. Can I say this? When people complained about the launch, the launch thing, which is like when Nintendo really don't got any games to play but Zelda. Okay, I can understand that, yes. But when Zelda is that good and you're continually talking about it and, and, and kind of almost like PS4 that you guys talked about Resogun more than anything else on PS4. It, it, it sounds like almost this is the same thing that when you get a four hundred dollar system like the or five hundred dollar system for Xbox One or PS4, you guys were still talking about one major game. For PS4, it was Resogun. Gun. For Switch, is uh is Zelda, and now people are playing the rest of the lunch games and they're realizing how good those games are. And even if One Two Switch wasn't for everybody. It still did business, and people are still getting some fun out of it. You know, it, uh, Snipper Clips is getting some fun out of it. So it's not the quantity of having a big major thing. It's the quality of it. And it just sounds like for all the games that you picked up, the quality is top-notch. You've been enjoying it. You know, it's, it's been worth the purchases. You really can't say that for the other systems. Oh, yeah. No, and I mean, there's, there's still... Uh two more games that I'm, I'm contemplating uh, buying that were out on launch day. Uh, the first of which is I am set Um I, I'm a little torn on whether or not to buy it. I have a hard time sinking into traditional RPGs anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just one of those genres that is as much as I like it. I have a hard time playing it anymore. Um, but I've, I've watched a, a couple of let's plays of it and I like the story, and I'm, I don't know if I can justify spending the 40 bucks on it. Um, a for a digital only, because if I, if I was gonna get it, I really want a physical copy. Not just because I am a whore for, you know, stacking games on my shelf, but because, uh, again, I, I appreciate good box art and good, you know, yeah. artwork annual and all that so, and that's a game that is super pretty so if you want the physical copy you won't have to import it from japan yeah yeah so you'll have to go like the amazon japan and have it shipped to you um because they got they got import copies and i didn't know that until i heard the recently uh a four play um one of their podcasters um mentioned that uh I have said Suno got the physical release and digital release because we only got the digital for both PS4 and Switch. Yeah. So, um, but you know, hey, at least it's not region lock. So if I really wanted to, and you, you uh, could play it. So, right. right. And, uh, there was another thing uh, that came out uh, about that. 
um, they were just like for developers who submit a game. I think like the I, it might be like the full version of a game. They said all you got to do is submit it once, and that's it. Right, right. Um, but which uh, we'll, I'll t- I'll go back and touch on that in a second here because that's that's a thing we need to talk about. We'll do that after games of the week. Um, but in any case, you know, so I'm I'm a little torn on whether or not I'm going to end up picking that up. Like I want to get it and play it. I just don't know if. I personally will get the 40 bucks out of it mm-hmm. because I have a hard time playing through that genre anymore. I can sit and watch it. I just have a tough time playing it these I, days. I think they say it's about 15 to 20 hours. So yeah. It's I, not, it's not a tough length, which I don't know. I'll, I'll figure it out in the next month. It's not like it's going anywhere. Um, but in any case, uh, the other one though, that I'm, I'm seriously contemplating is called a uh, Voez. Um, and it's a uh, it's a music rhythm game uh, that is actually uh, a touchscreen only. So on your Switch, you cannot play it on the TV. It is uh, it is handheld mode only. Yes. Um. So, but that's that's one that kind of piqued my interest, and I may be looking at in the next week or two as well. But that one is not out yet, right? No, it's out. I thought it was only out in Europe. No, it's on the shop channel. It's up there, but. Um, which, uh, again, brings me back to that thing that we'll talk about after we finish up, uh, you know, all the nonsense that we've been playing. So coming this week, I have a whole lot of writing to do because, uh, like I said, I'll be, uh, putting up the Zelda review. Uh, I'll be writing it up tonight and I'll put it up tomorrow or Monday as you guys listen to this. So, um, the same day to look forward to that. And then throughout the rest of the week, I'll be putting together some reviews on, uh, the other stuff I've been playing, Snipper Clip, Shovel Knight, Isaac, uh, and uh, Fast RMX. So there's there's some content uh, coming to the uh, Facebook page. So you all have my humble apologies for the fact that I have not posted shit in the last week, week and a half, because I've been stupidly busy. Okay. Um, for me, everybody, what I've been playing, um, I've been playing, of course, Breath of the Wild. Um, doing more shrines, finding more, uh, haven't really progressed the story just yet. I, I know I got two more parts that I need to do before I actually fight Ganon or Calamity Ganon, but I've just been going around doing some, uh, small stuff here and there, um, just exploring and searching more stuff. So hopefully I'll be finished with that probably soon. Um, I don't know when I'll actually finish the game because I kind of don't want to yet. I just kind of want to do it like next month. I want to finish it um, just to get, uh, you know, some more enjoyment out of it. Um, I've been playing Pokemon uh, still, uh, you know, enjoying that. Um, I finished the order 1886 and I am going to be doing a review. So when you guys see this podcast, you'll be able to check it out. Um, it's one of the blandest shooters uh, cover-based shooters that loses its way. And it, it, I don't know, what is it about Sony and their narrative? They're horrible. They're, <laughs> like, Sony's narratives, and even some of their story points, are just horrible. They're unori- They're not original. They're uncreative. It, it's just like, can you guys think about this and flesh it out better? Um, I'm playing Horizon Zero Dawn, and I, I, it, it's worth the sixty dollars. I will admit that. Um, I, I, I was really upset and disappointed at one of the points in the story, and so I like it. it you know, it's like a most wanted game. Yeah, you know, high markets, and I'm just like, okay, this game gets a six because this other that. Like, I was really upset and uh, and got mad. And I kind of posted on Twitter <laughs> about this. and had a little discussion about it. <laughs> and it was just like, why? I'm like, I love Sony and I love the developers. But why are your narratives horrible? You can talk about Mario and Zelda all you want to. That's fine. I'm trying to for horrible narratives. Stop, they once again did the flashback. And then it just feels like. They want to egg on the story. Like, there's all this extra con, all this extra narrative that's not needed. And it feels like their games are not edited well. Where something about The Last Guardian, I gave it, you know, I gave it straight a, pretty much almost a 10 out of 10. Like, this is one of the best games of 2016 for PS4 that I think uh, for last year. And 
because the narrative, you know, it just plays out and you, and you figure out what is being told, but you can feel the emotion. There's no, there's a little bit here and there of flashbacks to get understand the story. But you think about the relationship that Trico and your and you as the player are having, and so you know there's there's nothing. That sounds a little sexual. Shut up. <laughs> that's a whole kind of weird. That that's like bestiality, pedophile, all rolled into one with just fantasy, unreal creatures. Like, what the hell is that kid doing with that bird dog? <laughs> I was about to say riding him, but then I was just like, dang it, that's proving his point. <laughs> but see, subversive, uh, <laughs> you know, subliminal messages. Here. But the thing, but the thing about <laughs> the thing about uh, the last guardian is that the a, as much as people could, you can talk about the AI all you want to, but it's such a, a it's a gorgeous game and. Their relationship is very emotional, and you feel and you feel for Trico, and you feel for the boy, you feel for the characters, and you and definitely for a person like me, I love narrative, I love stories, and I'm not saying that the story in Horizons of Radon is bad. You know, I'm still figuring out. You know, hopefully when I get through the game, that you know I get an answer to what's going on. But some of the presentation is just. It feels out of sync, and it feels like they could have presented this better. And I mean, I I got upset. I got I actually caught feelings for a video game, <laughs> and I normally don't do that. Besides Grand Theft Auto Five, that just could stay in the garbage bin that it came from. Um, but Horizons Zero Dawn, I am going to write a review for it. Um, I am working my way to finishing the game. It, it has great combat. Um. I think the currency should have been separated than what they, the way that they did it. Um, but not, to, not having too many problems with it. Um, this, the, it, it looks gorgeous. And I can really say this, and hopefully a lot of people can agree that Horizon Zero Dawn and Zelda Breath of the Wild are two separate games. And if you, if you said that if they had to equal, I think Breath of the Wild holds more weight. Then, um, then uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, but I will say to represent each company, they're both equal. They're both great games, and you know, worthy for worthy worthy to play. I just think that um, uh, Breath of the Wild has done more, uh, not just for Nintendo, but for a whole genre. Where Horizons, they're both trying to do the same thing. They're just going about it differently. Yeah. Well, it, I I think that you know, you know, Horizon is not uh, it has role playing game mechanics, just like almost like the Legend of Zelda, but it's more of an action game in Tomb Raider. So it has that kind of feel, where Legend of Zelda is proven this is how you do a open world game when you're allowed to go anywhere and everywhere. Like you don't ha- have to go to the towers if you don't want to do the towers, fine, don't go there lose yourself in the game and just wander around like you don't have to unlock unlock the map nothing is forced upon you so uh but i feel like they're two separate games that you know they don't compete each other i feel like so in a way they kind of complement each other in a in a sense right two sides of the same coin almost yes so uh i mean i i got upset but you know i i I dealt with it. I moved on. Um, I is it deals more with discrimination with this game, um, and I can say that it has more black people in a video game than any other video game that I've seen. You know, does that include Resident Evil Five? Yes, that includes Resident Evil Five. <laughs> yes, and. And hopefully we can speak about Resident Evil Five. I didn't have nothing, no problem with the uh, with the being set in Africa. Like, I don't have no problem with Chris Redfield. I'm just harping back to the old uh, to when that came out, and there were screams of "This is a racist game. You're shooting black people." I'm like, it's set in Africa, you idiot. If it's a zombie outbreak in Africa, who do you think is going to be the fucking zombie? Right. 
So it's racist against black people, but when y'all have Call of Duty and it's all Russians or um, Muslims or whatever, whoever they design, and y'all oh, killing them 15,000 times, it's not racist? Like, wait, I don't get it. I know. It's stupid people being stupid and screaming about something for the sake of screaming about it. Because if we're not, you know, if, if they're not raising a ruckus, then nobody's paying attention to them. Yep, pretty much. Um, I haven't touched anything really, really much on my Xbox One. Not saying that I'm giving up on my Xbox One, but I'm trying to just catch up on past games and some of the current games that I that I got, so I could, uh, you know, review them, write about them, uh, and, and talk about them in the in the near future. Uh, other than that, uh. Uh, let me get back to the order eighteen eighty six, and then we'll move on because um, this is my last uh, last part about it. I re- I think Sucker Punch needs to do the order eighteen eighty seven. I think that they need to go into a overworld, a open world kind of game. Um, they they could keep a cover base if they want to. That's fine, um, but I think they. They need to find a story that fits this game, because with with the rich with this original game, I it it it's conf- not saying it's confusing, but it doesn't have a purpose. Like uh, is is the game supposed to be about werewolves and it's the supernatural, or is it a po- supposed to be about a resistance? Because I don't see why the Order 1886 is fighting the resistance 85% of the game, and then this supernatural about werewolves is part of it. Like, they're, they're, it doesn't make no sense. Like, I, I can understand if the resistance were being kidnapped or, you know, they had werewolf powers, like I could understand that, but it, it just it just feels weird and off. So, um, and it does the Bioshock Infinite last fight thing at the, all close to the end of the game before you fight the lat like the actual boss. And I was just like, oh, I like about die six seven times and be like, really? Are we really doing this? I'm like, well, I guess I got to push through. So I mean, I pushed through it and then finish the game. Like it took me only like maybe two days to beat it um right so uh because i had left and at one point i had put the game on pause and fell asleep (laughs) i think i was so bored or so tired i was just like okay whatever but i did finish the game so do expect a review and the pricing about that um I, i will say uh for my personal uh taste i would say it's a three Yoshi coins out of five, uh, but when I add a dollar amount, you guys will see what uh, what it's worth. So, uh, but we're gonna go ahead and move on since we started talking about the Legend of Zelda. Um, that was a quick pit stop before that because I mentioned something. Yes. Uh, for any of our listeners that are interested, because uh, we were talking about the uh, the non region lock on the Switch. Um, that does also uh, include the eShop. Now, there there's a little bit of a hassle to make it work, but it's not terrible. Um, you can get access to the uh, the European or the Japanese eShop as well, and it's not a huge thing to do. You just need to go in and set up a uh, an additional uh, My Nintendo account mm. and set your region to either you know Japan or Europe. And then uh, log in with that uh, My Nintendo account, and it will direct you to those regions' eShop channels. Um, so, in particular, like the Japanese one has a few things that we didn't get here in the states. Um, the real trick comes in buying something because uh, American uh, major credit cards are not accepted on the uh, on the European or the Japanese uh, eShop channels. So, there's there's kind of a roundabout solution. If you see something up there that you wanted to buy, um, what I've been reading and I've yet to test out myself is that the way to do it is to go on to uh, Amazon 
and uh, buy eShop credit for uh, the, the Japanese eShop and then load that credit on there and then spend it. Because you can buy that credit through Amazon mm-hmm. with uh, an American major credit card. So it's kind of roundabout, but if there's something really of interest, it's not super hard to do. It's just a little, uh, a few extra steps yeah. to get there. And uh, just let everybody know that whatever the currency exchange is, that be do be aware of that. So the, there is going to be a different uh, dollar amount. So just yep. be uh, just be aware of that. So if you decide to do that. Yep. Know what you're getting yourself into. But, you know, there there's a quick how-to for you if uh, if you're interested in that. <coughs> I suspect later in the uh, in the system's life cycle, that will probably become a, uh, a more used feature. Um, that or they may try and uh, steer people away from that just by going, look, it's out here. We'll put it out here. Fuck it. Just release everything everywhere. But... You know, for the the cases that they don't do that, there's at least you know options for you to get the game that you want. Yeah. Um, and wait for the local localization. If you don't, if they don't have an English subtitle or whatever, just wait for the localization of that game. If there's if there's not a localization and you still want it, do the do the route that uh, Larry tells you. So it's out there if you want it, um, and that's that's where I'll leave that. Uh, like Eddie said, though, uh, let's let's talk about Zelda. Um, we're we're not going to be talking spoilers or anything like that. We're we're talking about um, you know where does the franchise go from here uh, in a post Breath of the Wild world? Um, because Breath of the Wild has done so much. You know, I, I don't know that Zelda can go back to its formulaic release uh, that it's been doing for the last 15, 20 years um, since, say, Ocarina. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, every 3D Zelda has been essentially almost the same thing, you know, with some minor deviations here and there. Probably the biggest deviation in any 3D Zelda was Skyward Sword, but even still, you know, it wasn't that big of a departure other than just in some of the gameplay mechanics uh, by means of the, uh, the Motion Plus control. Um what I really think should happen, and I'm hoping that the the winter DLC that's coming is the first sign of that, is that Breath of the Wild becomes a a platform. Um, and I, I think it's a shame that it's it's going to be until winter that we see uh, a new story, um, which I, I'm glad they're doing it. But I do think that there's some stuff that probably could have been done between now and then to really keep people playing that whole time. Um, so with without going into any spoilers, you know, end of the game, you destroy... Okay, possible spoiler if you're going to be ridiculous about it. But, you know, you, you go in and you defeat Ganon. You've saved Hyrule, hooray. If that's a spoiler to you, you're dip, uh, you're you're a dipshit, and you deserve to have that spoiled. Because I'm sorry, that's what happens in every Zelda game. Suck it up, get over it. Um, but in any case, Breath of the Wild presents a unique opportunity here to use that game and that world as a platform um, to continue on from. Where I, I think it would be absolutely fascinating to explore and live in, you know, a post. Uh, Calamity Ganon world, you know, where after a hundred years of destruction and decay, um, looking at rebuilding this whole empire, this whole kingdom, um, little by little, where, you know, I, I think it would be neat to see if, like, you know, week over week, there were little mini updates to uh, story things where maybe there's there's a couple new little side quests in the, in the Zora's domain where, you know, they're rebuilding some stuff and somebody needs your help with this, that, or the other. And it's a couple of little fetch quests and you can get some new gear or something like that, you know, and it might be something that, you know, it's a couple quests that might take you a day to finish the content. And then the rest of the week, you can just spend your life as Link living in this world 
where, you know, you've, you've got a little home and a house and, you know, your day to day, you go out hunting for meat and supplies and everything and, you know, turning it into a, almost like a Legend of Zelda Animal Crossing, you know, a, a life simulator in Hyrule. And I think it'd be a brilliant way to just continue on, uh, in that world rather than looking ahead to going, okay, we've made Breath of the Wild, holy shit, what do we do for our next game? You know, I think this game could have legs for years if they did something like that. I would love to see what they would, you know, what could come of that. Because on top of that, you have the ability to further um, grow and become more familiar with the characters of that world by means of just some of their day-to-day, you know, activities that you could, you know, have some small involvement in by means of these little side quests. So well, I, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of going to disagree with you about that. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, I think after watching the GDC talk and seeing how, how they put all of that stuff together, but they did to make Breath of the Wild, it kind of amazes me that, uh, that they were able to make a game like this and to, and to have like what happens if you defeat Ganon and now it becomes somewhat of an animal crossing Minecraft kind of situation of a game. I think people will feel like they, that the Zelda team lost what makes a Zelda game. Now I would say, I I would say story wise, I would love to actually see what happened before the hundred years, before the calamity again, and see how and see how the deities became corrupted, and see what the guardians were like before they got contaminated. Like, and that hopefully that be the story DLC in the winter time, um, because because I think what I could do right now in Breath of the Wild that you just mentioned, all the stuff that you mentioned, I could do that right now at this current moment. Then what would happen if if they continue to update it like that for the game? And I think by that time, I think people will have moved on from The Legend of Zelda because there's going to probably be other open world games that people would love to get to do. Um, now, here's here's the caveat to that, though. It's not just, you know, life is grand again and we're just rebuilding the kingdom, you know, day to day. But I do think that sporadically, you know, every couple of months or so, it could be done where there's a major event that happens. You know, some some evil tries to, you know, storm the castle and, you know, there there's a, a bigger not like calamity ganon huge event Mm -hmm. you know or evil but at least you know something kind of middling size taking place that you know is is a bigger evil do that you've actually got to go out and defeat you know it gives you a a, almost another you know mini game or a, a miniature you know uh uh antagonist to, to defeat you know obviously not something to the the size and scale of calamity but you know at least something and it's I, I think it would be interesting to see uh you know what pops up here and there um and that's something that they could extend out for you know a year or two just to give it legs i i think would be sufficient but you know it's it's a neat way to get i, I think would be a neat way to keep people you know, ch- checking in on Hyrule in the in the months and possibly years after, um, you know, Calamity Ganon. Do you think the story of the Yiga Clan will work? Absolutely. There, there's probably something worth exploring there. You know, there there could easily be. Uh, oh God, I'm just giggling right now at the thought that popped into my head. That maybe there's a minor strike, you know, a, a union issue up in the core. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that would be a mess. And you know, I would, of it's course, hilarious. I'm a, like I would definitely buy. It. I think I would just want to see that whole thing to the fullest. Like, not even do any slide stuff. Be like, 
is there a, a, a union strike in the, in the Giga clan, right? Or No, with the Gorons. They're all miners. What if oh. they all fucking go on strike? Oh, wow. <laughs> you don't know. Maybe they're all union. Uh, that would be hilarious. <laughs> I really think that they could totally put a, a whole level of life and personality into the world of Hyrule when Ganon is not looming over. Mm -hmm. I think it could be absolutely fascinating to experience and explore that world. It, the, the thought intrigues me and I cannot shake it now that it's in my head. This has been rattling around my brain for the last week. I'm like, I would totally keep fucking playing that. You know, I would love to see, because we've never had a Hyrule so big and so alive as we got with Breath of the Wild. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it would be just a travesty to see it end where it does. You know, I, I do think that I, I'm curious to see what comes of this, you know, story DLC in the winter. And I hope that they at least do something like that, um, you know, where there's a new story injected into this world and there's a new, you know, evil that needs to be stopped. But I, I do think that they could have done more small stuff more consistently. And I think that would have been smart. Well, I think Nintendo, uh, the Zelda team, I think instead of doing things like that, I know their main focus is going to be like, okay, where do we take the, do we still work in this pedigree that we've made, the Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, do we take that template and make it another game and, you know, do the same thing but improve it? Or do we, uh, or or how do we go about uh, making the next Zelda? Because, you know, they're going to be talking about art style, physics, and stuff like that. So they'll probably be like, it would rather be better for them to use their time and resources for a new game instead of, you know... Uh, still using the world now I, I i can agree with you that they could make breath of the wild go longer to the next game comes out so there could be expansions for this game for people to come back to be like yeah if you got all 120 shrines how about you know we how about there were shrines that you didn't find because the temple of time was destroyed now right but, like, Absolutely. you know now that let's see if what would happen if you went to the Temple of Time uh, and you found these 30 shrines that end up getting destroyed or you going back saving, you know, getting stuff to help you build the Temple of Time or whatever back. Like, they could go and do something like that. Um, you know, I just had a thought uh, spitting into something you said. You know, what if somewhere in the uh, in the future DLC the the ocarina shows up and link ends up time traveling back to the uh you know the the ancient times when the sheikah were building all the guardians and everything they could do that you know that'd be neat yeah because there's a lot of guardians that's that haven't been activated that's like literally just like oh they were activated they're just dead and decayed they're not ones that are still active so but in, in any case um you know i i do think they have a lot of room that they could grow with this i don't think they're going to do as much with it as they could mm -hmm. but i i have some hopes well actually uh me and cory was talking about uh cory from nurse going wrong uh we was talking about this game design will fit Metroid better. I'm not sure if I entirely and agree with that. Let me can I, I see can, parts of it. Can can I can I, I explain why? Um, my thought of doing this Metroid game, and I and I talked about you know playing a young Samus, you know, and my thing is using this design see, game. That's the first right there. I don't want that. I do not want to play this young Samus thing. Well, no. well can I can I tell you the young Samus is when she's trained. 
and I and I feel like this like the world is open, but when she gets to like maybe a uh, a zone or something, it goes to two D. Like I, I feel like they could they could mix the gameplay style of other M, but keep the world of Breath of the Wild as a template to be used, like the open area, but going into different zones. They could do Metroid other M or go two D. Or you have this fixation with going back into uh, her her Chozo days that I just I, I have no interest in seeing the story go there. I I would love that. I just don't think it would work well in a in a game format. I've said it before and I'll say it again on the show no less that if they ever did anything with that, that's what they should make the movie out of. If God forbid that movie ever gets made, which at this point, part of me is kind of glad that it's probably dead and will never come around but if there was ever a metroid movie that's that's where that should happen is in a movie i just cannot see that it would feel too much to me like a really really drawn out uh you know 80s music training montage well i, I think what's they split because the, the metroid series kind of feels split at this moment with Prime and Prime Fusion, no, no split in this series at all. I think it is. I I I think it because I don't see all the connections of it of the Metro, and I probably have to watch. I know someone probably has like a recap or who, that could mm-hmm. connect everything. That's probably there, but I feel like it's split because everybody just like people feel like the Prime games is a different Metroid than the 2D Metroids, like the like the Game Boy Advance ones. Let's just call them like well, that. Gameplay-wise, or... yes, but it's all in the same timeline. You know, the Prime games all sit between Metroid 1 and Metroid 2. There is an actual place in the timeline for them. Gameplay-wise, yes, they are drastically different, you know, than the 2D ones, but they, they are not... Um, I mean, it's it's what different. In a vacuum. It, it's different because I feel like they're split because I think when they did Metro Prime Echoes, that what connection of Echoes have to do with Metro Prime Two itself? I, and I think because Metro Prime Two is a game that came out early, you really cannot reset it. Shout out to uh, Ao Two R. Still love you guys. Shout out to Daniel and them. Um, but with, with, I think once they did Echoes and uh, kind of just the Prime series itself, it's just like, how do Samus, who got all this power, been do all of this adventure, get into Metroid 2 and don't have that same power? Don't have Actually, that same power. She was not completely stripped from the get go. Um, Two, there was at least a couple things that she had out of the gate that normally she does not in the beginning of any of the other games, uh, that being missiles and her morph ball. Um, uh, they're, they're basic things, but you know if you think about it, look at any of the others, missiles and morph balls are missing with the exception of... Uh, no? Yeah, Echoes gave you the morph ball right off. Corruption did too. Prime 1 didn't, but... Yeah, that's that's one of those yeah. things. Um, but but those gameplay but those gameplay mechanics are in the prime games. That's in the rest of the Metroid, like the missiles and the morph ball. Right. So, right. Um, yeah, you know. it's it's one of those caveats of game design. It just it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think you know it's it's almost the same as any any long standing series. It's one of those you go really why? But at the same time, if you didn't you wouldn't have the game that you wanted. It's one of those moments of suspension of disbelief that is required to make the game work the way that you want it to work. Right. Yeah, because, like, corruption, you, <coughs> you know, is it, isn't that corrupted uh, Samus still alive at the end of uh, Corruption? Samus is still alive. Dark Samus is gone. Okay, so Dark Samus is yeah, gone. Yeah, because the Phazon is gone. She's destroyed the entire planet. 
all the Phazon is dead, gone, and eradicated from the universe. That's it. Okay. And then it goes into Metroid 2. Yeah. And then Metroid 3, uh, Super Metroid. Super Metroid, then Other M, and then Fusion. Fusion. Okay. Because it's just like, the, now, now when you think about it, it's just like the stuff that happened in the Prime series just just kept, just kept, keeps it, you know, separated. Because it's just like, do you now have to redo they Would Nintendo have to redo those old games to include the stuff from Metroid Prime? No. Not at all. And I, I think that's part of the benefit of having the Prime games kind of exist in their own bubble. Yeah. They do fit in a specific place in the timeline, but the events of that ser- of the Prime trilogy is self-contained so as not to disrupt anything else in the other games that chronologically happened after but were released before. Okay. So it's... I think they did that very intelligently. And I guess that's why I feel like some people see it as split uh, because of the Prime games. That people, Some people actually want more of the Prime games. But I, I think you pretty much can't do... I, I think you have to call it something else. Yeah, I like agree. You can't, oh, go ahead, Larry. No, I, I'm, I'm absolutely in agreement on that because Prime is gone. That, that was the whole point was that the the Prime Trilogy followed Metroid Prime, which, you know, for those that don't know, at the end of the first Prime game, uh, Prime lived on through uh, Echoes and Corruption as Dark Samus. Yes. So that's, that's where the title came from. And given that Dark Samus is gone, Prime is gone, so no, to, to continue to, you know, call it uh, anything in the in the prime line, I think would be incorrect. If I, I would be okay with seeing another self-contained bubble series, um, somewhere along the line, it's not what I want to see next out of the series, because, but I, I would be okay with it at some point. Because Metroid fusion is four. It's yep. the four. It's the actual four. Yeah. Fusion is the end of the story as we know it so far. Yeah. So where does, um, and, and that, and I think that's why I said, um, uh, going with, uh, like, uh, uh, using the breath of the wild, <laughs> trying to bring it back to the other since we got into Metroid. Sorry about that, everybody. I did not steer it there for the record. This was not my doing this I time. I did it. I did it. And when, if you got anything to say about it, you can email the show or leave it on the comments <laughs> on our Facebook page. We'll read them. Um, but it's, I, I feel like, I, I, definitely for me, I, I feel like with this Metroid game, like this open world Metro game, um, like, I don't know. I, I feel like it could be split in a sense that at a point that if you progress the story as Young Samus, somehow there's a res- resurrection of Mother Brain. I know, I know she's, I know she's dead and gone and Super Metroid. But I just, I don't know. It just feels like I would love to fight uh, Muscle Brain again in an, in another game. I don't know. I just, I, I, I can't translate the Breath of the Wild format into Metroid. It just doesn't work for me. Because uh, I'm like, because at this point in time, I'm like, how do you translate the Metroid Fusion a Samus now? Like, how do, like... How 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 do you how does she recover from that? I don't think she recovers. I think she progressively gets worse, and I think that's that's what I want to see next is what happens. I've I've said it before, mm-hmm. and I, I swear I would not talk about it again. But we're here now, and it is not my fucking fault. But you know, I would love to see something along the lines of what uh, you know we've seen in some of the old Spider Man comics. Where you know the 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 Metroid DNA starts having more drastic effects and causing more physical mutations, and I, I think that would be fascinating to see her cope with that. And uh, 
I, I've got all kinds of weird story ideas in my head that I won't get into, but because uh, everybody's going to be like, will Nintendo cure Sims? And if that's the next case of of because I think Metroid Fusion has a temporary cure to just have you know that works for that game, but will Samus actually? get back to having a, fear, a full cure that she doesn't need the Metroid DNA. Right. I, I I don't know. I think it would be interesting if if they went into possibly seeing you know her trying to track down maybe the last living Chozo mm-hmm. that you know could help sort out the uh, the Metroid DNA and the uh, the par- the ex parasite DNA that are all infused with her at this point and are, you know, just on a genetic level battling it out inside of her body. I think it could be fascinating. But again, that's me and my just insane fan theory. But well, I, I won't go any deeper on that. Well, do you uh, think Bre- the Breath of the Wild can still work for Metroid if she lands on the, par- uh, on the planet that she finds new te- technology? That's, that's I just, other than, than uh, the Chozo? I, I really don't think the the format that they went with Breath of the Wild works for Metroid. Plain and simple, I don't. What I do think, and I do hope, though, is that, for me, Breath of the Wild pulls the... part of the best parts of the original NES Metroid mm-hmm. forward into modern-day game design all while looking at what they've been doing for the last 15 years and going, okay, we need to stop rehashing this and we need to, you know, breathe some new life into this series. How do we do it? What are the pain points? You know, what what do we change? What new things do we introduce? And I think that would be a very smart thing for them to do with Metroid, just in terms of... Breaking the, uh, breaking the conversion... In terms of design approach, you know, looking at it and going, what have we, what have we gotten away from that we should be coming back to? What are the fundamental roots? And then what are the parts that, you know, have become pain points that we need to totally revamp? Well, for Metroid, definitely it's going to have to be weapons. Like, they have to come up with a whole new weapon list. She needs new guns. She needs new abilities. Like I think I'm people... fascinated if if they explore deeper and the the mutations that are happening are causing her to have issues with using her cannon and she becomes a more close range melee character. I think that would be option. I think they with with Samus in her suit, um, she wouldn't be able to. I think it wouldn't be a Metro game. A lot of people would say it wouldn't be a Metro game if she didn't have no kind of projectiles at all. Because then what's going to happen is well, what Nintendo did was they just pretty much took Platinum's idea and made this a uh, a Metroid Bayonetta style game. Now I, I think we're missing the real. Real question here. What does Breath of the Wild mean for the future of Tuna Cycle? Um, that's a lot. Uh, Where does Tuna Cycle go from here in a post-Zelda world? Um, Tuna what Cycle, happens to Lewis and Louise, damn it? Tuna Cycle would have to go with 3D, and <laughs> that's a whole different art style that Adrian and his crew... I don't know if they're capable of doing that just yet. <laughs> I mean, I'm still waiting on my Tuna Cycle uh, DLC, but, you know, whatever. I think you'll be waiting on that one for a good while. Oh. Uh, so, but yeah. Um, that being said, I vote we take a break, and then we will uh, get back into our uh, our last topic here. Um, we're, we're going to be talking about, uh, sex and sexism and, uh, gender roles and whatnot as portrayed in, uh, projected in, uh, mainstream gaming. Uh, so, 
uh, we'll see you back here in just a moment. Uh, break. All right, so first and foremost, before we go any further, during the break, Eddie stepped away from his computer, but he left all the Skype stuff on. I'm convinced that you need to open up like a 24-7 subscription live stream of just whatever the hell is going on in your house. (laughs) All I could hear was somebody screaming, that's assault! That was me. After I said, okay, so let me give you context of what happened. I don't want context. It's perfect the way it is in my head. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, I just, I picture that it's nothing but a Tyler Perry movie going on outside the four walls of it your room. It pretty much could have when I just see. I'm just like, wait, what? <laughs> like, that's a song. Yeah, it's uh, like I'm convinced that Medea lives downstairs from you. Oh, good. <laughs> Not I, I. I probably wouldn't even be living here. If that was <laughs> just. Not even Medea. Just Tyler Perry in a fat suit as Medea lives downstairs. Like everyone knows that it's Tyler Perry, but just doesn't acknowledge the fact and just acts like it is, in fact, Medea. And then then she's out the blue. That's the (laughs) thought. Yup. Uh, You get half of everything. I'm going to take a chainsaw to this couch. (laughs) Oh, God. Goodness. Anyways, so I'm done with that tangent, but that thought makes me exceptionally happy. (laughs) Oh, wow. I didn't even know that you caught that. I just like that vision of your house in my head, and I just want to be able to tune in to whatever the hell is going on at any time. Oh, wow. (laughs) I can't. (laughs) Everybody, that's why we're a professionalist, uh, a trade wreck of professionalism. That's us. Oh, God. So, (laughs) on a, uh, on a, a slightly heavier, meatier topic... Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about, um, or I want to drive the discussion towards uh, sex, sexism, uh, and anything related as portrayed in mainstream gaming. Um, I, I got into it with uh, somebody last weekend, and it, it kind of sparked a thought in my head, and it's not even a fully formed thought a whole week later, but um, it's, it's enough that I want to uh, dig into it and check it out. Um, and just talk it up and see where it goes from there. Uh, I was having, I hesitate to call it a discussion. It devolved to an argument, but, um, Conversation. no, this was a fucking argument. Um, and I, I can't believe some of the things that somebody said, but in any case, um, in, in probably the, the most expected place you'd find me was, you know, in a, a Metroid group on Facebook, but somebody had posted some, uh, some fan art and it was well drawn. Um, but the, the, the topic of conversation, uh, headed towards the fact that said fan art, uh, kind of toned down the, uh, the, the TNA on Samus. And, um, I, I, it kind of irked me a little bit just in the thought that, you know, to me, the the character of Samus is as she is because 
that's how she was imagined by the, uh, you know, by uh, Gunpei, you know, like this, this is the character. This is the artist envisioning of the character. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is what it is. It's not necessarily that she was drawn that way to, you know, sexualize or, you know, sexually exploit the character, but just because that's how she is. And this person went on about how, you know, that once, once an artist puts something into the world, that the responsibility of what happens to it, uh, you know, that, that character, that creation afterwards is still on the artist, no matter what somebody else does with it. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? You know? So by your logic, you're telling me that if an artist draws and creates a character, however that character happens to appear in that artist's mind, that if somebody decides to, you know, sexualize that character, that that responsibility falls on the artist. I'm like, no, you idiot. That's the, that's the same train of logic that goes by saying, you know, if a woman was raped, then the responsibility is on the mom for, you know, giving birth to a child that was sexually attractive to somebody that decided to be an asshole and rape her. I'm like, you're a fucking idiot, you know. But on top of that, too, I, I, I got my brain running on a weird tangent going, you know, there's an entire personality aspect of this character that's never been explored, you know. Maybe outside of being the, the badass that, you know, has to be in order to save the fucking universe, that maybe she enjoys, you know, dressing in a way that is, you know, sexually appealing, that she she feels good about herself. Maybe she's a sex-positive character, but you don't know because we've never talked about that. That's never been a, a canon thing because it's not part of the personality that's relevant to the story that anybody's telling. Who are you to make that fucking determination at this point? And I think it's ridiculous, you know. Um, but beyond that, I, I do think that the the argument of, and I think Laura Croft is probably the biggest um, example of this, where there there was for a while there there was so much um, bullshit flying around about you know the the character of. Uh, Laura Croft, you know, with these, these huge, ridiculous proportions that truthfully may not be all that, you know, ridiculous. I know many, 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 many women, and they come in all fucking shapes and sizes, you know, and it's it's not to say that it, it does not exist. It's just saying that, you know, that may fall to the stereotypical concept of attraction, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with, you know having a, a female character that's attractive because maybe, you know, dressing in a way that, you know, is attractive makes that person feel good. And that's perfectly fucking okay too, you know, but it also makes me think too, there, there's a very one-sided conversation here in the fact that, you know, and it may be too, that that character was created to be, you know, to, to draw on some, you know, some male sexual inclination and possibly female sexual inclination, you know, we're, we're in a, a broad day and age, you know, where I'm sure that there are some women that I know that would look at Laura Croft and, you know, from back when and go, I'd hit it. Okay. And, but that being said, it, it shocks me that there's not any, anything about the, that argument swinging on the other side either. You know, we, we look at most of the male protagonists in any game, and most of them are all, you know, stereotypical, either, you know, good-looking, uh, you know, well-dressed, or, you know, uber-fucking muscle-bound and ripped, and it's, you know, that, that falls in the category of sexualization in a different direction, too, but nobody talks about that either, you know. Um, uh, scars and insanity aside... You know, Kratos is a pretty ripped dude running around and, you know, with no shirt and monster fucking pecs and ripped fucking guns. I'm like, I know a couple women that, you know, if you scrub off the uh, the ashes of your dead family would probably go, I'd hit it, you know. And it's why is this not a topic of conversation? Why, 
why do we have to put a huge focus on making female characters uh, anything less than whatever they happen to be, that they have to be normalized or, you know, or toned down, which I, I think at this point, for the sake of conversation, is the same as saying normalizing them, that by no means can any awesome chick have, you know, uh, a, a set of tits and an ass, but um, it just, it, it boggles me. Well, can, let me jump in and say this. Um, the first part, uh, art accountability, being accountable for your artwork as an artist. I agree with you. You cannot place blame of, of original concept of original artist thing. You took someone else's art and you envision it as yourself. You cannot go and blame whoever made Sevens for whatever you design. You had a uh, you seen that and you thought that okay, I could do a different version of that. And you cannot place that blame on anybody. You could have created your own character and probably gave them the same name and never said nothing about it, Metroid. But because you created that as your original own art, you are accountable for that. Uh, No one else is accountable for your art. You have to take responsibility of what is being said and done to your artwork because you drew it. You can't blame nobody else for that. Secondly, um, over like over sexualization of women and men uh, in general too, is that there's something that's supposed to be an art appeal um, to to uh, gamers. Definitely, if you draw a woman sexy um, and thinking it's about the booty and it's the, and the breast, it's not always about that because you're placing body parts over personality characteristics gameplay um the history of the character you're placing all of that as like that's not important you know so when you look at laura croft okay yes she can't be big and overweight because she's a adventurer who has if you play the tomb raider games what 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 overweighted person as a female character is able to handle that kind of exercise, that kind of activity. Not saying that it can't be done or anything, but you can't. But you don't see a, a overweight person that could do like that. That could get into that kind of, that could do those kind of movements. And and I just want to say that we're talking about fictional fictional video game characters. We're having the discussion about fish, fictional video game characters. So don't get mad that we're talking about real people in life, but you know, you would you you could see something in Fat Princess that the princess is getting fat, being you know eating all the cake and people get the um, little munchkins or whatever is trying to carry it. Okay, that's weight. That's kind of almost somewhat in the real world, even though I just said we're talking about fictional characters. But if you pick a big person up and you're not a person who can handle that weight. Of course, you're going to move slow because you're trying to you're trying to handle that weight and not crush yourself. So something like that works. Um, thinking about it in art is that we we could argue about a character but overlook the boobs and the breasts. Really, we overlook it in Dead or Alive, and that even had a beach ball beach volleyball game where. They had jiggle physics that they <laughs> work on. For the record, Dead or Alive is just creepy because, frankly, I, I don't care what you say. It's a bunch of underage, like they're they're 15, 16, 17. So if you spanked it to Dead or Alive, you're a creepy pedo. But people think that uh, there's a lot of male developers who has the <clears throat> mindset of making a female character sexy that it will appeal to the player. So that appeal will help them. It's another form of marketing that will help them buy the game. But it's not always about that. You can have the most beautiful woman, and she can have the breasts and boobs and all that, the, uh, the butt and the boobs, all that she wants to, and your game can play could be terrible. 
it could be bargain bin terrible. So it's just, I don't know, like you said, it was just one of those things that I, I got into this conversation and it just, it got me thinking and it had me kind of irked and I wanted a chance to, to vent it out somewhere. Um, so that, that, I don't know. Well, I, well, I, I think the thing about it is, is that when it comes to women um, in video games, it, it, from, an art, from an artist perception uh, viewpoint, is that they think that a female character has to be skinny because their, uh, you know, their movement and reflexes wouldn't work with someone overweight. But sometimes it that's... It doesn't have to be overweight, but, you know, sometimes just an average, you know, girl next door, just, you know, regular proportions is fine too. But, you know, uh, by by the same token too... I I can understand and respect the fact that when you're creating something that you want to sell, you know, you want to drive an appeal. And, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm a pudgy guy. I'm, I'm not huge, but I'm not small and I'm not ripped. Like I, I'm planning on getting my summer body ready, my beach body, just by taking a Sharpie marker and writing on my stomach, perfect abs. (laughs) Well, I've got perfect abs. It's labeled right here. But well, I, I, you know, well, I think, oh, <laughs> keeps say, you know, but I understand that that in terms of marketing, you know, we want to buy buy something where we can play as somebody that we would want to in, you know, in fantasize as being. And if that means that, you know, maybe for a couple hours I get to escape to not being the the, the overweight, pudge-bearded fucker that I am mm-hmm. to, you know, being somebody athletic and muscular and attractive, then, you know, I don't see a problem with this. You know, I'm not holding any other guy to that standard, and, you know, I'm not holding any other woman to any standard of anything that I see in a game. And so it's, I, I think some of the, the conversation is horribly misdirected in terms of, you know, stop blaming and demanding that characters have to be, you know, changed because it's, you know, it's not creating a, an unrealistic uh, expectation. But, you know, just look at the the expectations that are being put forth and look at the people that are putting those expectations forth and going, maybe there's some fucking responsibility there. Stop throwing everything at people that are creating these characters. There, there, there's got to be a level of accountability to to deal with here, and I, I think some of it's being misdirected. And I'm I'm about out of brain power on this thought. It, like I said, it was half baked when I had the thought well, for the conversation, and it's still you know not all the way cooked. But if it was there enough that I wanted to to talk about it. Well, if you look at. Uh... I think it's Donima, um, the that the African American woman lead character, and uh, when they was doing the uh, Nindy showcase, she was the black girl with the scarf, and she was um, like that two D platform and stuff. Yeah, like that's something that's going to be empowering because we, first of all, even though she's a female character, she's an African American character. That's a, that's something you don't get to control in a video game. So it's not about sexualizing that character. It's actually playing a character within that race as as that being as your main character and making her making her have those powers and strong. And sometimes you get sometimes you'll even think that I'm not even thinking about the character because I'm having so much fun. You know, and the story yeah. and stuff is interesting. Even, even like I was talking about earlier with Horizon Zero Dawn with uh, with Aloy. You know, dealing with discrimination. You know, they're not. She, she's not over sexualized. Uh, some of the characters are not even over sexualized. But I'm enjoying the game because I love the gameplay that it offers, and it's showing me that due discrimination that she's getting. And it's not even her race. It's, it's everybody seeing her as an outcast because she wasn't born the way that they were born. 
and that is able to tell a better story and give me better insight. You know, they could have made her full of boobs and and a butt and stuff. That wouldn't do nothing to do nothing about me. Look at Bayonetta too. You know, I talk more about the gameplay and then the way that she looks and her her using her sexualization is so over the top and, and it's so funny that I I could look at her and still be able to respect her because guess what? I get to wear chainsaws at her shoes and drop kick demons and angels. Right. You know, and and you know, the the artwork is supposed to be appealing and stuff and kind of, you know, making a joke about that. But it's just like she's more to that. And if you stop at one point of thinking that she's sexy and if you stop there, you're missing the whole point of why the characters were designed in the first place. Yeah. So, but that's, you know, that's all I got. It's late. My brain is frying. But I just, I, it, I, I felt it needed to be talked about at least somewhere. Um, the the thought should be put out in the open and allowed to bounce around. And you know, if if you know anybody listening has any further thoughts you know i'd i'd love to explore it a little bit deeper and you know go from there and just hear some other people's thoughts on the subject um you know especially the opposing gender uh because i I really think that you know that needs to be present in this conversation um but that's uh, unfortunately wasn't something that could be arranged for for this evening's show either but um, but yeah, I, I'm perfectly okay leaving it there for the moment. I just kind of put an idea out into the wild and, you know, let it live. All right. And everybody, then that is our show. We're going to get into some plugs. Larry, you have anything to plug? Um, no, check us out. We're on iTunes. I, with any luck, I will get the Google play RSS feed submitted this week. So we can be on Google, and you can get us on your Android phone, too. Um, uh, Reviews are coming this week for a whole mess of stuff. Um, I just got to hunker down and finally get some writing done. Um, Like I said, time has been limited, but I should have some more of that coming up. Um, So you should see a a slew of reviews starting to come out on the Facebook page this week. Um, Other than that, no... You know, just keep your eyes peeled to the Facebook page, not only for reviews, but, you know, if, uh, you know, any news of note or real worth comes out, um, you know, I, I'd make an effort to, to post it there and, you know, put a little context there and, uh, you know, hopefully bring some things of interest to your, uh, you know, to your guys' attention. So. And hopefully we'll have a discussion with the guys at Fandom Furniture in the coming weeks. Hopefully. Yes, uh, I'm trying to arrange that. Uh, their their work schedule is a little peculiar and it generally conflicts with our recording schedule. But uh, yeah, yeah, we'll get we'll get some things together. Um, so do check that out in the future. You guys can find this podcast at shoutengine.com, iTunes, uh, soon, uh, well, SoundCloud, and soon Google Play Music. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at world one underscore one podcast. Um, you can email the show at world one one podcast at gmail.com. Um, I'm going to plug my show optional opinion. You guys can find that at the anonymous radio network dot popping dot com, iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, um, and other podcast apps just like world one one. Uh, uh, since it's on shout engine, you'll be able to just plug it in any podcast app. <laughs> And we should be able to come up and we can find all our episodes there. Um, like Larry said, we got a lot of reviews coming. Um, I am on Power Block. You guys can find that at nerdsgonewrong.com or NGR Radio. Uh, check that out on Facebook and on our website. Um, I do have a new blog for NGR. It's called Fresh, um, Fresh Freedom. Uh, you can check that out. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> you can check that out at the World One of One Podcast Forum page. You'll be able to click on there and give it a good read. Um, 
I, like I said, I am coming in with two blogs. So you can, at this time of this work recording, you guys can check it out. Um, the first one is about colors and gangs. It's my uh, annual event where I talk about colors and gangs. And I try to, it's, it's more about, you know, rejoicing that spring is here. Um, because spring kind of brings in a new set of colors. Like, it's like, kind of like a new start, new refreshery. And I will have the, uh, the review for the Order 1886 that you guys will be able to check out. Other than that, um, just to let everybody know that we are recording um, next Sunday. Um, there's There was a change in my plan. Uh, I didn't realize it, so we will be having a show um, to record on the 26th to give you guys on the 27th. So do be on the lookout for that. And we are getting ready. F- we'll soon be getting ready for our E3 plans. Our very own Larry Giver will be down in uh at e3 so we guys we be planning shows um having discussions about what larry has seen and how it has played um we'll definitely have reactions on the conferences um i'm taking that week that whole week off or taking some time off to watch all the conferences i'm going to be super busy holding it down not only for world one-on-one just like larry is but i'll be doing optional opinion uh like a thousand of being a guest of, of other shows and getting um, insight, but like our very own Larry Giver, we'll be having hands on. Um, we'll be talking more about Switch uh, with some of their games and uh, more for PS4 and Xbox as games come along because we have Mass Effect Andromeda coming, uh, Persona 5. Um, Larry's going to uh, soon have his Mario Kart Deluxe uh, game. Uh, Again, <laughs> I want to say game bank, uh, <laughs> in a sense. Um, so there's going to be a lot of content. Hopefully, Adrian and Tony will be on to give some of their thoughts about Zelda and what they've been playing, what they've been up to. So with that, everybody, we will talk to you later. Have a great week. Have a great weekend. Be safe. Uh, spring has started, um, so the weather might get hot. It might get cold. We don't know. Might be a lot of rain. But do enjoy the week and do uh, look out for our content that's coming up. And with that, everybody, we are out. Bye. Good night.